uh, German mercenaries Recording in progress. and Native American tr uh, warriors had just seized the great uh, rebel fortification at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, and so he was so convinced that Fort Ticonderoga, as you all know, guide, guards the, the, the traditional invasion route from Canada um, south on Lake Champlain and then into Lake George and then on to the Hudson River Valley. So the king, uh, he was so thrilled about this, he thought that the strategy that they had put into place the preceding spring was going exactly according to plan and that this pesky revolution would be over very soon. Uh, unfortunately for uh, the king, uh, uh, in less than two months after his impromptu celebration, Burgoyne and his army met, had met with this unprecedented disaster and the British were faced with a very, very different war. So how did this come about? What were the implications of that defeat? That's what some of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Now, if you were to, to take a, you know, a Excel spreadsheet and kind of line up the strengths and weaknesses of both sides, it'd be pretty clear that the, uh, you know, the British forces would probably win. Uh, but if you've done any, any uh, reading at all about military history, and I'm sure all of you have, or you wouldn't be here, you know that that's not necessarily the case. And certainly wasn't the case uh, with, uh, with the British. Okay, so again, I've got to continue on here with my two remotes. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about all the causes of the war or anything like that, but I do wanna put the uh, Saratoga campaign into a military context. And that's what we'll do here on this slide. Of course, we all know what happened uh, uh, August, uh, uh, or excuse me, April 75, of course, the shot heard around the world, Lexington and Concord. Uh, and then Ethan Allen and uh, Benedict Arnold will seize Fort Ticonderoga. Ultimately, they'll move the guns to Boston. Uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, July 1775. Washington takes command uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and then, of course, we've got uh, as well, we've got uh, Quebec, uh, the first attempt to, of the Americans to seize uh, Canada, uh, ends up in a failure. Uh, the Brits will try to take, um, uh, take Charleston. Uh, they'll fail in that, uh, in that attempt. Uh, they'll succeed later on in the war, but they'll fail then. Uh, the British will evacuate Boston. Probably one of you like that, right? And that's, what, that's what an assignment at the Pentagon does for you. You learn PowerPoint really well. Um, <laughs> then they're going to come back, though. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the Brits will come back, of course, and they'll conduct the battles of, you know, on Long Island and Manhattan. The Americans will conduct that headlong retreat uh, back south um, uh, across New York. Jersey, and then uh, the Brits will try to, uh, I'm a little bit behind on, my, on this part. Okay, the Brits will try to uh, uh, come down uh, Lake Champlain, south on Lake Champlain. They'll be stopped in part at the Battle of Valcour Island. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, Washington will basically stop the bleeding at the twin battles of Trenton and Princeton uh, there in January, or excuse me, December of 76 and January of 1777. <laughs> But what the British do at, at that point is they realize that the war isn't going to be over quickly uh, and they have to come up with a new strategy for 1777. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. And this is this, I think, is one of the most fascinating and confusing parts of the Saratoga campaign. And that's how they develop their strategy for the 1770 for 1777. Now, strategy is has to be one of the most misused and overused word in, in the English language, one of the most. I mean, you hear it all the time, right? We just finished this bitter midterm campaign. And how many times did you hear, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's Oz's strategy here going into the debate? And what, uh, you know, what are we, uh, what, what is uh, President Biden going to do if there's a red wave? And what is his strategy? And, well, that isn't strategy, okay? So strategy, simply put, a very simple definition is the calculated application of ways and means to achieve a political objective or a military objective. Now that sounds really, really simple, right? But as it turns out, strategy is really, really hard. Otherwise we'd be a lot better at it. Um, I, I give you Afghanistan as an example. Uh, we're not very good at it. And I would argue we haven't been very good at it since probably World War II. 
Um, but at any rate, uh, these are the four primary drivers of British strategy in 1777. At the top there, we've got the King George III, uh, who's going to be, uh, actually, he's going to have his fingers in British military strategy in 1777. And on the right there, we have General uh, Sir William Howe, who's the, Ameri or the British commander-in-chief with his headquarters in New York City. At the bottom there, we have Lieutenant General John Burgoyne, uh, who will uh, be a major player in the strategy, and then, of course, the overall campaign itself. And then finally, on the left, we have uh, Lord George Germain, who is Secretary of State for the Colonies for the Brits, and consequently, he's the guy who is responsible for managing uh, the war in North America, or he has the primary responsibility for that, excuse me. So um, in early seven, late 1776, early 1777, both Burgoyne and Howe are going to per, uh, offer up competing plans for ending the rebellion in 1777. It was ultimately up to Lord Germain to reconcile those two plans uh, and come up with some sort of uh, overall strategy. So this is Burgoyne's plan. Uh, Burgoyne's plan, now uh, Burgoyne is in London. So he has the opportunity to present his case directly to the king and directly to Germain. Um, and so he obviously has an advantage there. So his, his plan is to have three converging columns. Uh, the first one will come down from Canada. Um, well, that'll be the main uh, British army in Canada. It'll come down that Lake, Lake George, Lake Champlain, Hudson River corridor, ultimately to get all the way, take, seize Fort Ticonderoga and come all the way to Albany. And then there's gonna be a supporting column. Uh, they're also gonna come down from Canada. They're gonna go into uh, Lake Ontario and then ultimately down the Mohawk River Valley also linking up at Albany. And then the final part of his plan calls for the main British army in New York City under General Howe to come up the Hudson River, also link up with these two other columns. And then ultimately they would do some unspecified offensive operations into New England. The whole idea here was to cut off, seize control of the Hudson River Valley, cut off the more rebellious, what they thought was the more rebellious New England colonies away from what they thought was the less rebellious middle and southern colonies and therefore divide, basically divide and conquer. So that's his plan. It's a very imaginative plan. It's um, a very complex plan. Uh, even today with our modern communications, uh, this would be sort of a hard plan to pull off. And uh, he's trying to do that in the um, you know, 18th century uh, with uh, 18th century speed of communications, 18th century um, um, uh, diff uh, challenges of operating in wilderness terrain and so on. But that's his plan. And it's eagerly embraced by both the King and Germain. They really, really like it. Um, this is General Howe's plan. Now, General Howe is the commander in chief in North America. He's sitting in New York City, remember? He's not in London. He presents his plan also in early 1777. He has decided by early 1777 that George Washington and his army are the center, they are the center of gravity of the American Revolution. If you can destroy Washington, destroy the army, you can win the, you will win the war. So that's what Howe has, that's what Howe has figured out over the course of uh, uh, campaigning up to early 1777. So his plan is to seize Philadelphia. Oops. Do, do, excuse me, seize Philadelphia, and that he basically used Philadelphia as bait to get Washington to defend Philadelphia, and then he would lure him into this, uh, this decisive battle. He decides to, um, instead of marching overland, he decides to take his army, um, instead of marching overland, he's going to take his army by sea. Uh, he's going to do that with uh, the help of his brother, Lord Richard Howe, who is the naval commander uh, in uh, North America, uh, Royal Navy commander. And he's gonna uh, take his army and basically go by sea. So that way he doesn't have to worry about guarding his lines of communications across New Jersey and, and so on. Again, hoping that he's going to uh, convince Washington to come to the aid of Philadelphia and that way he can destroy Washington and his army. So those are the two plans. It's up to Germain to try to either pick one and go with it or come up to, with some sort of coordinated overall strategy. Um, so one of the big problems with um, the British trying to coordinate their strategy is uh, the distance issue. 
Um, so when you think about it, I'm, again, I apologize, I'm going, these two things here are a little awkward. But um, basically what you've got is you've got three of those key decision makers are sitting in London. One of the key decision makers is sitting there in New York City and they're 3,000 miles apart. And on a good, uh, uh, under good circumstances, it takes six weeks to get a message from London to New York City or vice versa. And then of course, it takes another six to eight weeks to get a message back. So trying to coordinate this strategy under these circumstances is very, very difficult. And they're gonna have a problem with it. And um, so um, that's gonna be a problem throughout. And if you're gonna try to micromanage strategy from London, um, you're going to have a problem, mainly because of communications. Um, and, and in the United States, excuse me, well, yeah, I guess it is the United States. We've already had the declaration. So in the United States itself, you also have fast distances. And of course, a man, you know, a message can only go as fast as a man can travel on a horse. So uh, just to give you an idea, from Canada all the way down to the battlefields of Saratoga, it's about 250 miles. From Saratoga down to Philadelphia, where Washington is, it's about 300 miles. So that, that's a problem, uh, or it's a, at least it's a, it's a huge challenge. So again, as I said before, it's, uh, it's Burgoyne, excuse me, Germain's uh, job to coordinate the strategy. So what ends up happening because these messages, because of the issues with these messages going back and forth and because Germain wants to please everybody, he approves Burgoyne's plan, he approves Howe's plan. But he tells how, okay, once you finish in Philadelphia, then you need to go help Burgoyne. Well, the problem is because of all these distances and times and everything, how doesn't get doesn't get that piece of the, the order until he's already at sea heading to Philadelphia. By that time, it's way too late. Uh, so, all there, so what this leads to, instead of having one coordinated strategy, it ends up being two uncoordinated strategies uh, in which um, there's almost no cooperation between the two. And so what you end up having is uh, a bad overall strategy. And I can tell you, as someone who has taught this for many years at the Army War College, um, I don't care how good your tactics are, they can't overcome a bad strategy. And almost one of the arguments in my book is almost everything that comes out of the Saratoga campaign can be traced directly back to this horrible, horrible strategy. All right, so let's talk about the Saratoga campaign itself now, because time's a wasting. So uh, Burgoyne is going to come down the uh, uh, Lake, Lake Champlain. Uh, his uh, other uh, supporting column uh, is going to down the St. Lawrence into the, uh, Lake Ontario and then down towards the Mohawk River Valley. And then, of course, what Howe is going to do is he's going to go by sea and he's going to head off towards um, uh, towards Philadelphia. So Burgoyne is going to leave from Canada on the 14th of June, 1777. St. Leger, who is commanding that supporting column going down Lake, Lake Ontario and then ultimately down uh, the Mohawk River, is going to leave Canada on the 23rd of June with about 1,800 men. He'll arrive at the head of the Mohawk River on about the uh, 2nd of August. Howe's main force will load on ships on the 8th of July, but they, can't, they don't set sail for almost 20 days after that because they have to wait for a favorable wind. These are all, of course, sailing ships. So, you know, what you would normally think sailing, sailing is going to be quicker, it's going to actually be a lot, lot slower. Uh, the American army, uh, excuse me, uh, Washington is commanding the main army there, who is uh, mainly watching how. And then uh, Major General Philip Schuyler is commanding the, uh, the American Northern Army up there. Okay, this is the comparison of forces. Uh, there you can see uh, you've got uh, Major General Philip Schuyler is commanding the uh, American Northern Army. He's going to be facing Lieutenant General John Burgoyne right there. And under the, at the very bottom, the 1800 troops, that's that supporting column uh, going up. Ultimately, uh, their, their goal is to go down the, uh, uh, the Mohawk River. Major General Philip Schuyler, um, he is a native New Yorker. Uh, he lived in the Saratoga area, upper, comes across as this upper class patrician, which he is. Uh, he's, he's a little bit haughty. He is not popular by, uh, uh, amongst the militia troops. 
especially by New England militia troops. They really don't like him at all. Uh, Burgoyne, he is a career British cavalry officer. He's known to be very aggressive and flamboyant. Um, he's also pretty arrogant and pompous, but actually for that period of time, his troops really, really liked him. They, they, they thought very highly of him, uh, he, mainly because he took care of the troops, uh, which wasn't all that common uh, back then uh, during that period. Oh, let me get, see if I can, there we go. okay. All right, so Ticonderoga. Be ambidextrous. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just a little thrown off by the technology. Um, okay, Fort Ticonderoga. We're going come, comes uh, south on Lake Champlain. He arrives at Fort Ticonderoga on the second of July. He expected this to take a long time. Uh, in fact, he brings a big uh, artillery train with him, thinking that he's going to have to do a, a major siege. Uh, so he expects this to be the toughest part of his entire campaign. Uh, but through th some skillful maneuvering, he's able to convince the American commander there, uh, Major General Arthur Sinclair, he's the, uh, that's the American commander. Uh, he convinces uh, Sinclair that his uh, position is hopeless. And although he's only outnumbered two to one, which actually, if you're behind fortifications, those are pretty good odds. Uh, uh, he gets, uh, he convinces Sinclair that uh, his, uh, his mission is hopeless. So Sinclair will, uh, will retreat, abandon Fort Ticonderoga uh, in just a couple days. And Burgoyne is able to march in almost without firing a shot. So this is the news that King George III had received in late, late uh, August, 1777, that, that Ticonderoga fell almost without firing a shot. So in a matter of days, Burgoyne's campaign is off to a rousing start and he's really thrilled. It's, and it's impossible to overstate how, what a huge blow this was to the Americans. Uh, Washington, Congress, um, almost everybody, the population, almost everybody felt that Ticonderoga was impregnable. There was no way the British were able to take it. At least they weren't gonna be able to take it for quite some time but yet it falls almost immediately. So it's a huge blow to American morale at this point. In fact, um, uh, George, uh, excuse me, um, John Adams wrote his wife uh, right after he gets the word about Fort Ticonderoga. And of course, this is after a series of uh, failures of American arms with the exception of Trenton and Princeton really. And he said, you know, if we don't shoot a general, we'll never hold a post. So we have to, we have to you know, we have to shoot a general to encourage the others. Um, so uh, he's, he's very upset about it. Now the uh, supporting force, uh, they're coming down again, coming uh, actually up the St. Lawrence River into Lake Ontario. Uh, they have an easy, easy, uh, easy march of it. They get to um, uh, the Mohawk River on the 2nd of August and they run into a fort that they think has been abandoned but actually turns out that Fort Schuyler, uh, located at present day Rome, New York. In fact, there's a great reproduction of that. If you ever go up there, it's a super place to visit. Um, they, they arrive there and instead the Fort Schuyler has been repaired and it's, uh, uh, it's filled with uh, about 600 very plucky Americans under a young uh, Colonel, 26 year old Colonel named Peter Gansevoort. And so St. Leger, who outnumbers these Americans uh, over three to one, uh, has to settle into a siege. And so the Americans with, will withstand a siege of 22 days uh, there at Schuyler, at Fort Schuyler, Fort Stanwix. Uh, and they'll actually, it'll actually be a, a, a great success on the Americans' part. And it's a, it's a great contrast between the leadership that the Americans show at Fort Stanwix versus the leadership that the Americans show up at Ticonderoga. Uh, it's a complete, just a, a, a total contrast between the two. Uh, in fact, uh, when the American, when St. Leger, the British uh, force, arrives outside of Fort Stanwix, uh, Colonel Gansevoort sends a letter uh, to uh, his boss, uh, General Schuyler, saying, uh, you know, we are not going to make a Ticonderoga of it. And so, and the Americans don't. They hold out for, like I said, 22 days uh, successfully. They successfully withstand the siege. And there you can see St. Leger's force coming down and showing up outside Fort Stanwix. Uh, and they start to lay siege to Fort Stanwix. 
So um, on the 6th of, uh, um, 6th of August, just a couple of days after the siege starts, uh, an American force of militia tries to lift the siege, try to come, tries to come to the fort's rescue, and they will march up the uh, Mohawk River heading towards uh, Stanwix, and they will be uh, intercepted and ambushed by uh, a force primarily of Indian warriors uh, under the command of General St. Leger. Uh, and the resulting Battle of Oriskany is going to be about the bloodiest battle in, uh, in Revolutionary War history by the number of soldiers involved, by the percentage of soldiers involved. Just an absolutely horrific hand-to-hand uh, -hand fight. But the result of it is they don't, the militia doesn't get anywhere close to Fort Stanwix, uh, and they're unable to relieve uh, uh, Stanwix. Ultimately, however, uh, a force will come up from the main army uh, under uh, General Benedict Arnold, and they will cha basically chase St. Leger, as you can see, back, back to Canada. Uh, then uh, Arnold will march to the fort, make sure everything's okay, and then he'll quickly go back to the main body. Not quite that quickly, but pretty quickly. Okay, so what we've got now is we've got St. Leger's force has been stopped, and you can see there, and you've got um, Burgoyne at Ticonderoga. He sees Ticonderoga. Now we're going to zero in on that box there, that red box. That is the area where the rest of the campaign will play out. So before I, I continue, though, just a very quick aside, maybe we can explore this in Q&A. But I found it really fascinating looking at the two commanders in chief. They couldn't be more different. Uh, so you have General Howe, British General Howe on the right. You have the American uh, George Washington on the left, both uh, commanders in chief of their respective forces. Um, Howe is focused laser. He is laser focused on Washington's army. Um, he, um, he's, com he's also commanding his own army, but he's laser focused on, on uh, uh, attacking and destroying Washington's army. He's not looking at the big picture. So once Burgoyne heads south from Canada, once he, once he moves into New York, he's technically under the command of Howe at that point. But Howe basically ignores what's going on up in the Northern theater, totally ignores it. He, he basically is not acting as a commander in chief. He's acting as an army commander, but not as a commander in chief. Washington, on the other hand, uh, acts as a true commander commander in chief. He's not only worried about how he's also providing support to Schuyler. He's sending him reinforcements. Uh, he's sending him leaders. Uh, and what happens after Ticonderoga, Schuyler starts to panic. And even though he does a pretty decent job, all of his letters and reports coming back from Washington and to Congress uh, indicate a man who is almost on the verge of a, of a nervous breakdown almost. And so Washington, like I said, sends reinforcements up to help Schuyler out. But more important than that, he sends leaders up to Schuyler uh, to help out, to put some backbone into Schuyler. And one of the things he, one of the, those leaders that he sends up there is, um, uh, is uh, Benedict Arnold, uh, arguably his most dynamic, aggressive combat commander. He sends Benjamin Lincoln up there, Major General Benjamin Lincoln, a uh, name that most of us have never heard of. But Benjamin Lincoln was really, really popular amongst the militia, and Washington knew how important militia was going to be in that northern campaign. So he sends Benjamin Lincoln up there to work with the, uh, the militia. Uh, he sends other reinforcements. Most famously, he'll send up Morgan's riflemen up there. Think, think SEAL Team 6, okay? It's a low-density, high-demand. Everybody wants Morgan's riflemen. Uh, but Washington will unselfishly send send those guys up to help Schuyler uh, up in the northern department. So in, in very interesting contrast between these two uh, commanders. Okay, so let's, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly uh, covering this campaign. Here you see the two major commanders, uh, Burgoyne and Schuyler. Uh, and you can see the blue is the Americans, the red are the Brits. Uh, the Brits are there at Ticonderoga. They've just seized Ticonderoga, as I've mentioned. Uh, the Americans will retreat off to the west. Uh, Burgoyne will chase them, or he'll send a pursuing force. Uh, they'll fight the uh, small but very important Battle of Hubberton, where the rear guard of the Americans will stop the British pursuit. Again, very small battle. Uh, most people have never heard of it, but it's a really important one. 
Uh, the British will continue on and uh, will fight a, another fight at, uh, at Skeensboro, where well, they will run into more retreating Americans. Uh, they'll destroy all the American watercraft on uh, Lake Champlain uh, at that point, seize a lot of supplies. Uh, the Americans will retreat headlong south. And then Burgoyne will very slowly move south and Schuyler will continue to move uh, and, and to stay away from him and Schuyler will continue to move south. Now, um, when Burgoyne does that, um, the, the PowerPoint makes it seem, of course, like they're moving a lot faster than they are. They're actually moving very, very slowly. If you follow the timeline bar on the right, you can see they're moving very, very slowly. That's because although Schuyler is sending all these panic messages back to uh, Washington and Congress, um, he's actually doing a pretty good job delaying Burgoyne as he's moving south. And what that does is what the Americans are trying to do is trade space for time, trade space for time until, until Schuyler can get his army reconstituted after the disaster of Ticonderoga. And then ultimately somewhere farther south, he will, he will hopefully turn and face Burgoyne. Uh, and then hope, hopefully, hoping to again, draw Burgoyne deeper and deeper and deeper into the American, uh, into the American hinterlands here. Uh, and force him really cause a logistical uh, problem. Now, uh, hopefully somebody will ask me this about in, during Q and A, but um, Burgoyne starts to have major logistical problems right around this time because he leaves Canada without enough supplies and without enough transport. So again, when we get to Q and A, ask me why he did that. Um, there's, there's a reason, and actually he would, he, if he was standing here today, he'd argue, I have good reason to do that, and let me explain why, and I think I can explain why too. So at any rate, he continues to move south. Uh, again, very, very slowly, the Americans will obstruct his route. Um, they'll conduct some hit and run uh, operations to slow him down. Uh, but Burgoyne starts running into more and more and more logistical problems. He'll go from Fort Edward down to Fort Miller. By the time he gets to Fort Miller now, here you can see he, it's the um, beginning of August. Uh, he starts running into very acute logistical problems. And so he, he decides to send a major uh, foraging party out to gather transport and supplies. And he does that. Um, Right around this time, by the way, uh, the Congress and Washington have been fed up with Schuyler and they replace him, they relieve him of command, and they replace him with this man, uh, Major General Horatio Gates. Now, Horatio Gates is a really interesting guy. We can maybe talk about him a little bit more in Q&A. Former British Army officer, um, stayed in America after the French and Indian War, married an American girl, loved America, decided to stay. Uh, when the revolution starts, he offers up his... Uh, his services, he gets along really well with Washington early on, but they, they've had a falling out by this time. Uh, so they are not getting along by this time. But he is, he is um, uh, he's very well liked amongst the militia. And so that's one of the major reasons why Congress puts him back in charge because, because the militia is not coming out for Schuyler. Uh, as it turns out, they will come out for Gates. Gates is a very defensive minded uh, general. He's not, not super aggressive. Uh, but he's pretty good with logistics. He understands logistics. He understands he's a good manager. Uh, not a particularly fantastic leader, but he's a good manager. All right, so uh, Burgoyne is going to send this foraging party out. Uh, they head to a place called Bennington, which uh, they've heard has, has uh, plenty of logistics and support and uh, transport. Uh, they are going to be intercepted by an American force uh, predominantly uh, composed of militia under Brigadier General John Stark. And this thousand man British, British German um, column is going to basically be destroyed. So Burgoyne by this time has about 6,000 soldiers, a little, well, actually about 7,000 soldiers. He's just lost a thousand in a day. That's a problem. He's also got all these logistical problems. Now you'd think maybe at this point you might want to reconsider this whole plan and maybe think maybe maybe we ought to go back to Fort Ticonderoga, kind of figure out what we're going to do here. No, he decides to press on. He'll argue later that his orders gave him no latitude but to press on, which of course is ridiculous, um, which we can talk about that in Q&A as well. So um, he uh, decides that uh, he's going to cross over to the west bank of the Hudson River, 
where the road network to Albany uh, is uh, is there. You notice the, the American army has moved north. Now what Gates has done is he has taken over. He is edging the army north. Uh, and they find some great terrain at a place called Bemis Heights. And at that place, uh, he will dig in. Remember, he's this, he's this very defensive-minded general. And he will dig in at this place called Bemis Heights. Uh, Burgoyne will, uh, there you see him digging in. And Burgoyne, again, will cross over to the West Bank and he'll proceed south. Catch up over here. There we go. All right. And finally, on the uh, 19th of September, um, 1777, they will clash in the first battle of Saratoga. Uh, at this battle, the, uh, the British will hold the ground, so they have a nominal victory there, but they've lost uh, about 900 soldiers. The Americans have only lost about 300. Now, at this point, the, the Americans and the British are about on equal terms. They're about 6,000 soldiers apiece. But the problem is, for the British, is Gates has put out the word to all the local, you know, all the, the nearby New England governors sending, selling me send, send militia, and they start coming in in droves. So by the time, in just a couple weeks later, by the time of the second battle of Saratoga, the American army is now 11,000. And Burgoyne, of course, he is getting weaker and weaker and weaker, while the Americans are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. He has to cut his rations twice, uh, and um, it looks, it, he's, he's really getting in, into trouble. Uh, and he's trying to consider, you know, do I fall back? Do I keep going? And about that time, he gets a lifeline from uh, his friend, Lieutenant General Clinton. He also digs in, by the way, after the first battle of Saratoga. There you can see him digging in. Okay. So, Henry Clinton. Henry Clinton is uh, Howe's second in command. He's been left behind in New York City with the vague orders to help Burgoyne if you can. But your most important thing you need to do is hold on to New York City while I'm fighting Washington and Philadelphia. So Clinton, um, you know, he has gotten a couple messages from Burgoyne. Most of them are very positive. Hey, I'm doing great. I see Fort Ticonderoga. I'm moving south. I'll be at Albany pretty soon. And then late September, he gets a different message from Burgoyne saying, I'm in deep trouble. You got to come and help. Well, Clinton uh, is shocked about this, but okay. So he puts together a 3,000 man uh, force. He gets three Royal Navy warships uh, and some transports and he sails up the Hudson River. He has no illusions that he's gonna be able to fight his way all the way to Burgoyne, but he's hoping that maybe he can draw off some American forces and ease the way for, for Burgoyne. Uh, it is not to be, however, um, because Clinton, the closest Clinton will get is about 70 miles to Burgoyne. That's as close as he's gonna get. And he's ultimately gonna be forced to fall back. After seizing the American forts at, uh, uh, on the, in the Hudson Highlands of Fort Clinton and Fort uh, Montgomery. Uh, but he's ultimately gonna have to fall back. He burns the town of Kingston, uh, but that's about as far as he goes. Now, this is a picture I took of uh, the American positions up at Bemis Heights. Here you can see how they're, they're really outstanding positions. They, they totally, um, dominate the road to Albany. It's the same road, about the same, same location as the road to Albany back then, and the Hudson River. So in order for Burgoyne to get to Albany, he's got to get past the Americans on uh, uh, Bemis Heights. Now, um, while all this drama was happening with Clinton trying to come to Burgoyne's rescue, there's also drama happening on the American side. Um, Benedict Arnold, who commanded the right flank of the American forces, who did most of the fighting on the 19th of um, the 19th of September, is very upset with uh, Gates for two reasons. Number one, he thinks Gates is being very timid and he needs to be aggressive and let's go out and you know let's go after Burgoyne where he's sitting. Uh, and number two, he doesn't think Gates gave him enough credit, or not him necessarily, but his troops enough credit when Gates wrote his after action report after the first battle. So what turns out, what starts the shouting match between the two men will degenerate into a juvenile exchange of letters over the next two weeks, even though their headquarters are about half a mile apart. <laughs> so literally over two weeks, they send these, they're, they're actually hilarious reading these letters. You know, it's basically, oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Uh, that's about, that's about as, 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 um, as sophisticated as they get. Back and forth and back and forth. Now, 
what one of the big myths of Saratoga is that I hope I've dispelled in the book is that uh, when the and this is this is carried on through almost every book about Saratoga, and that is that this this quarrel was still in effect during the Second Battle of Saratoga. That um, Gates had relieved um, uh, Benedict Arnold, put him under arrest. Um, that when the battle started, uh, 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 Benedict Arnold, without orders, rode off won the battle by himself while Gates was cowering in his tent on the 7th of October. Didn't happen. That is not the way it happened. Um, sometime between the last letter they wrote to each other on the 3rd of October and the actual battle on the 7th of October, they somehow buried the hatchet. We know that because there is newly discovered evidence and old evidence put to, when you put it all together, um, they are operating uh, pretty well together. Uh, Benedict Arnold has never been, was never relieved of command. Uh, 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 General uh, Gates is in full command of the army. He's not hiding in some tent on the 7th of uh, October, 1777. So on the 17th of October, uh, 7th of October, 1777 is the second battle. I'm gonna go through this very, very fast. Um, basically what happens is because they are so concerned, uh, his, his logistical situation is so bad, uh, Burgoyne will personally lead a 1700 man reconnaissance and force operation to try to find some forage and fodder for his horses and some food for his men. Uh, and so he leads this force out of their fortifications. They run across a wheat field that hasn't been harvested yet. So they immediately set out to harvest the, these uh, uh, fields. Here you can see Gates now is 11,000 men to about 6,000. Uh, the Americans spot their movement right away. Uh, Gates sends out Morgan's riflemen and another brigade, excuse me, to start the fight. And almost immediately, the British uh, force uh, uh, starts to give way uh, under this uh, pressure. Uh, more Americans will pile on, uh, and the British will start to uh, uh, slowly start to collapse. Uh, they, they'll defend pretty, pretty well, very bravely, uh, but it's a very disorganized defense. And ultimately, uh, the Brits will have to fall back. They lose probably their best combat commander, sort of the, the Benedict Arnold equivalent on the British side. Brigadier General Simon Fraser is shot in the gut, uh, and he'll die in agony the next morning. Um, and then he was buried the, uh, later on that day. And this is a painting that's in, in my book, um, a dramatic painting showing his uh, funeral the next day. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, again, you know, I just, just explained how the Arnold and Gates had, had overcome their quarrel. Uh, and at one point during this fight, while, um, let me get ahead there. Um, while the, the, it looks like the British are starting to collapse back into their fortifications, uh, Arnold will ride back to uh, Bemis Heights. He'll ride up to Gates and he'll, he said, um, I'll paraphrase here, give me, it's late in the day, but let me have some men and we'll have some fun with them before sunset. And Gates gives uh, Arnold uh, another brigade and another uh, part of a brigade. And Arnold will personally lead that force forward. Uh, and ultimately he will uh, lead that force right into the German readout uh, where he'll be seriously wounded, but the Americans will have a toehold on the British right flank and that will force the British to, uh, to fall back. And now Burgoyne has no choice, he has to fall back. And he will do that uh, starting the next day. And over the course of the next couple of days, uh, they will retreat north under a driving rain. They'll grind to a halt at a place called Saratoga. And there you can see um, he will retreat north and Gates will follow him. And ultimately the Americans will surround him. By this time, the Americans are up to 17,000 men. Uh, Burgoyne has right around 6,000 and uh, it's all just a matter of time by that point. Um, they'll have some tense negotiations over the next couple of days, um, but what uh, Burgoyne may have lacked in generalship, uh, he made up uh, with pretty good negotiating skills. Uh, and he actually negotiates a pretty good, uh, pretty good result there, but still he has to surrender. And this is of course the famous Trumbull painting that hang, uh, hangs in the uh, Capitol Rotunda. And so on the 17th of October, while an American band played Yankee Doodle, 
Burgoyne surrendered his army to Gates. And the, the picture is supposed to uh, um, uh, depict uh, when Burgoyne is handing his sword to, uh, to Gates and Gates will graciously decline his sword. So what are the strategic implications? They're huge, they're short-term implications. The British only have two field armies in North America, they've just lost one. Um, US morale up, British morale down. Uh, now the Brits have to worry about foreign intervention. Now they have to worry about things like homeland security that they really didn't have to worry about before. Now they have to worry about parliamentary opposition to the uh, administration, uh, which is, uh, becomes very emboldened. Uh, on the, for long term, though, the most important thing is we have the American diplomatic uh, mission over there in Paris, led by Benjamin Franklin there in the middle. Uh, he will conduct brilliant negotiations, uh, playing the French off the British, and will convince uh, Louis the uh, 16th there on the right uh, to sign the, uh, the famous treaty on the 6th of February, uh, 1778. Of course, uh, you know, Winston Churchill once said, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. And uh, the Americans soon, uh, pretty, pretty quickly, uh, learned the truth of that. Uh, the French turn out to be difficult allies, but ultimately, of course, they will ultimately uh, provide naval support to the Americans and, and will ultimately land an army under Rochambeau, who will link up with Washington, of course, leading to the, uh, the ultimate victory at, um, uh, at Yorktown. Um, so, um, and of course, at that point, the war will, you know, with the French coming in, now the British have to worry about what they, you know, what they dreaded. They dreaded a wider war. Uh, and now, uh, the, you know, the French are going to come in on the American side. Ultimately, the Spanish will come in on the American side. And you're, now, the, now the British are faced with the global war. And very quickly, the American theater becomes a secondary theater. Even though they'll continue to fight for several more years, um, the, the, now the British have to worry about their possessions in the West Indies, in the Far East, in the Mediterranean, uh, all these different areas that they really didn't have to worry about. Uh, until the French come in on the American side. So, you know, I, I would say that, you know, the Saratoga campaign wasn't um, sufficient for American victory, but it certainly was necessary. There had to be a Saratoga. Didn't have to be Saratoga. There had to be some kind of a Saratoga, some type of a military catalyst that would convince the French to come in uh, on our side. And it just happened to be uh, that. So, um, uh, so although, again, although Saratoga wasn't sufficient to guarantee American independence, I think it was necessary. And it was, as one American general wrote, the day after Burgoyne's surrender, it was the complete victory. So thank you. And I know I zipped through that really fast. I apologize, but hopefully this will lead to some good Q&A. And I did, you know, the book is 500 some pages, so I hardly scratched the surface. But I hope we can, you know, maybe tease out some more interesting things here during the Q and A. All right, everyone. Uh, now is the time. If you have any questions, please please raise your hand. I'll be right to you. And if you have any questions, our audience in the Zoom, please put them in the chat, and we will um, we'll ask. So. Sir. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, real thank you. I have, I have read your book with a great deal of thank you. It is, and this is too So long. you're the one. I'm the one. <laughs> uh, I am the one, yes. To those of you who are listening, if you want a book you cannot put down, and that will teach you a lot about the Battle of Saratoga, I highly recommend it. The complete victory. Now, my question, which you did not address, and I know what you did not address, Burgoyne expected Howe to come north. Howe elected to go to Philadelphia. How did that affect Burgoyne, not only with the army, but emotionally and in terms of his later strategy? Yeah. Um, Burgoyne, well, how. Had never intended to come up the Hudson. 
So, and in, uh, in early April, 1777, he writes a letter to General Carleton, who is the British commander in chief in Canada. And Carleton gave it, we know that he gave the letter to Burgoyne. And this letter said, don't expect me to come up the Hudson. I'm not coming up the Hudson. I'm going to Philadelphia. So you better not be planning on me coming up the Hudson. So Burgoyne knew from the get-go that Howe wasn't coming up. And he would later argue that, well, I just figured there'd be other orders that would countermand that and that he was going to come up the Hudson. Let's assume that. Well, wow, that's a bad, that's a pretty bad assumption. Um, he never did his due diligence. In other words, he never wrote back to Howe saying, well, I, wait, wait, I was under the under, I was under the impression that you were coming up the Hudson. Um, so my and, and when you read all of Burgoyne's correspondence, which of course I did, um, you, it, it's crystal clear that Burgoyne thought he'd have no problem getting to Albany, whether Howe was coming up the Hudson or not. He had complete confidence. It's only after Bennington, after he loses those thousand men at Bennington, that he starts to get a little nervous. And he starts saying, well, where's Howe? Which is totally disingenuous because he knew Howe wasn't coming. So at that point, after, after Bennington, he is starting to prepare his defense. It's, it's very clear that he's starting to prepare his defense. So, Basically, to answer your question is he um, until he started running into trouble, he was not concerned at all because he thought he had total confidence. He was overconfident, which was part of his problem, uh, that he was going to be able to get to Albany without whether how was coming up or not. All right. We have a question from our Zoom audience. Yeah. And I actually it would be helpful for our audience on Zoom if you would repeat the questions. Oh, the, OK, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'm sure. sure. No, no problem. No problem. Sure. Uh, did Germain really understand the implications of approving of how and Burgoyne's plan? Yeah. So the question is, did did Germain understand the implications of um, approving both the plans instead of just approving one or some combination or or something like that? Um, no, I don't think he did. And the reason why is. Um, Germain, I think, shows a total misunderstanding or lack of understanding of what it took to conduct the campaign in North America. I think he thought he was thinking plain, the plains of Europe. That's that's where his experience. He was a former general, so he fought in the French uh, Seven Years' War, uh, famously at the Battle of Minden. So he he understands fighting on the plains of Europe, where the distances aren't nearly as great. Uh, where the, you know there's there's not an undeveloped wilderness that you have to go through and all that stuff. He understands that. He has never been in North America. He's never he's never served there. And I think he th I really think he thinks that oh it won't take you know it won't be a big deal for for how to go take care of that Philadelphia thing and then go help Burgoyne. It'll be easy, no problem. I think he told he just misunderstands how tough it would be to fight in North America. How gets it? As soon as Howe gets that letter, he immediately sends a letter back to, to uh, Germain saying, boss, you don't, you don't get it. There is no way I'm going to be able to wrap up this. This may take weeks and weeks and weeks for me to conduct this Philadelphia campaign. And then when I'm done, yeah, I'll try uh, to help Burgoyne. And of course, by the time he's all done, Burgoyne is ready. So, so I think that's, that's, that's his big problem. Uh, this question doesn't, this is specific to uh, Sarah Pope, but I'm kind of curious when Pope write books about historical events. Obviously, there are other books that have been written about Sarah Pope. Mm -hmm. There are, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of books that have been written about various campaigns. Sure. How did you, what was the process uh, that brought you to think that uh, the Sarah Pope campaign was one that would? Could use another book. <laughs> well, why did you think that your book was going to be different or more insightful, if you will, than others? Okay, well, the, the question is um, because there's been so many books written about Saratoga and the American Revolution, why did I think there needed to be another one? Uh, what sets mine apart, I guess? Um, 
there's been a lot of books about Saratoga and some really good books. Uh, Richard Ketchum's book is really good. Um, Saratoga, The Turning Point, I think it's called. Um, I highly recommend that. That's a really good book. Um, but what I what I try to do, and I think what what does set mine apart a bit, is that I really tried to get into this the strategy. You know what most most authors about uh, the Saratoga campaign want to get to the sexy battles right away, and so they 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 tend the rest of the campaign. You know the the Fort Stanwix siege and you know all this other stuff. The Philadelphia campaign, which is really an important part of what's going on up there in Saratoga, uh, they tend to, you know, not, not, not ignore it, but, but get through it really quick because they want to get to the battles. And, and I get that. I understand that. Uh, to me, personally, the battles are the least important part of this campaign. Uh, the most important parts of this campaign, and although I cover the battles in great detail and all that, um, the most important part of this this whole campaign in 1777 is that strategy. And so what I what I try to do with my book is the strategy is it, there's there's two th things that two threads that weave themselves throughout the the book um, strategy and the other thing is leadership two things that I'm really interested in two things that I teach at the War College and so and I think um, you know maybe maybe it's my military background I don't know but um, those are things that really interest me and and I think so far I think they've interested the readers um getting good feedback on that so um that that's that's what i think makes uh makes my book a little bit different yes sir and my question is hold on hold on you're getting a workout <laughs> yeah <laughs> my question is with regard to british and the strategy did they take many, many months to find out the lay of the land and all the strategic locations? Yeah. How the trails were? The trails sure. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the British, when they're coming up with their strategy, did they, you know, take take a long time to really plan it out and look at the, look for the routes and things like that? Um, they had um, Burgoyne had been part of the 1776 initial invasion uh, from Canada. So he was relatively familiar with the ground all the way to Ticonderoga. Beyond that, he didn't have any information beyond that. So what he tried to do was um, recruit as many loyalists as he possibly could. In fact, that's when going back to my, when I was talking about the logistics thing, he, he, per, he, he made the, he was willing to take risk leaving Canada without enough logistics, without enough supplies and without enough um, transport. Why did he do that? In part, it's because of that reason. He thought that he was going to have so many loyalists coming out of the woodwork to help him that they would they would basically uh, fill that shortfall in logistics and transport. As it turned out, American loyalists did not come out in droves. He got some support, uh, but not nearly enough. And so that was an assumption he made in his planning. Uh, that that turned out to be wildly incorrect, and that's going to, in part, lead him to his his disastrous end. Another another assumption he made is that he was going to be able to recruit at least a thousand Native Americans uh, to support him. Uh, General Carlton does a really good job trying to recruit as many Native Americans as he can. He gets about five hundred though, so he gets about half of what he needs. Um, so that's another assumption that goes wrong. And after Bennington. All of his Native Americans look around, they go, this looks like a sinking ship, and they all desert. So by the time he gets to Saratoga and the, and the battles of Saratoga, all of his Native Americans are gone. So all those guys who were doing scouting for him and conducting raids, all these Native American warriors, they're gone. He's lost all those guys. He doesn't have cavalry or anything like that. So he doesn't have, he doesn't have the folks who can go out and sneak and peek and you know, do his recons for him. Uh, so he's after his Native Americans take off, he's kind of stumbling around after that point. So great question. I added a bunch. Of there, so. Yes, sir. Um, so I was just wondering what you think about Burgoyne and and what you think about the way he's treated after the battle. Yeah. Which is pretty harsh, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what do I personally think about Burgoyne and how he was treated after the battle? Um, 
Actually, I don't think he was treated harsh enough, frankly, after after the campaign. I think he was, he, you know, he comes back to uh, uh, England and he blames everybody in sight and takes no responsibility whatsoever. So he blames how he blames Germaine. Uh, he blames the king in many ways. He was a Tory. He becomes a um, Whig. Um, you know, I mean, the guy the guy's just trying to shove off the he blames the Germans. And the Germans fight very, very well, very bravely in this campaign. He's blaming everybody, takes absolutely no responsibility. So now what, what I think about him personally is I think he was a he was a good man, totally out of his depth. I think they picked absolutely the wrong guy for this. He had no experience, even though he was a career army officer, uh, he had no experience with uh, independent command. So here you're giving him probably the toughest independent command that a British officer is going to get during the war. You know, going through the American wilderness and fighting their way through that, that is, he was not the guy to give that job to. Uh, Henry Clinton, who actually they were friends, Burgoyne and Clinton were friends, um, desperately wanted that job. Uh, Clinton probably would have done a better job, I think, had they given, and he was senior to Burgoyne. Uh, so he felt, felt he should have had that job. Um, he probably would have done a better job, but hard, hard to know. The, the, thing, the thing about Burgoyne, I mean, here's a guy who, um, you know, he exudes self-confidence. He's this cavalry. I mean, I've known many cavalrymen. <laughs> they, they all have plenty of confidence um, uh, and hubris. And, you know, um, they, tend, they can be pompous a bit and arrogant. Um, and that's what, that's what Burgoyne was. But, that, of course, that's what you need for, for a cavalryman. But, but here, once he starts getting into trouble, I mean, you've got to understand if you're a senior commander with independent command that you can't be shackled to a plan that was written five months before and 3,000 miles away. You have, to, you have to make decisions based on the realities on the ground. And he wasn't doing that. He said, my orders told me I got to go to Albany. I got to keep going to Albany, even if I lose my entire army. So I blame a lot of people for the bad strategy but you can only blame one guy, I think, for the loss of the army. And that's Burgoyne. Personal opinion. My question is what happened to the British and German Army Corps at the battle? Okay. So the question is what happened to the British and American, or excuse me, the British and German soldiers once they were captured? And what did the, what about the Americans up in the northern uh, department? Uh, the, it, it's actually a, kind of a tragic story. Uh, I don't cover it in a whole lot of depth, but I do, I do talk about it in the book. There's actually been books written about this. Um, when, remember I said Burgoyne was a really good negotiator at the end? And what he negotiates as part of the terms of his surrender is that his army would be able to go back to England uh, as long as they promised never to serve in North America again against the Americans. Well... You know, that's a, that's, that's a huge success for the Brits. That means they really haven't lost an army because once they got back to England, you just replace them with an equal number of soldiers and you haven't lost anything. And so it was very favorable terms. And Washington and Congress, even though they were ecstatic about the victory, they looked at the terms and they said, whoa, bad idea. This is bad. This means we haven't really captured an army. And so, um, so the Americans started, and the British were doing the same thing, but the Americans started saying, okay, um, we are going to hold them to the exact letter of this uh, surrender document. And so if they don't, they, if they don't meet every single letter period uh, comma on this surrender document, we're not going to let them go to England. So they did things like, well, this calls for you uh, to turn over every officer's sidearm. You haven't turned over every officer's sidearm. You're not going back to England. It says to turn over every regimental color. We found you were trying to hide that regimental color and smuggle it back to England. You're not going back to England. You're, you didn't abide by the treaty. So, the, so basically, they never get back to England. Uh, they turn into basically, basically POWs. And the Americans will march them around uh, America, keeping them away from any other British forces so they couldn't rescue them. So it's actually a sort of a tragic story because these guys get marched from, from Saratoga to Boston, down to Charlottesville, Virginia, back to York, Pennsylvania, 
And in the process, of course, many of them will die of disease. Um, many, many of them desert. And many of them will become Americans because they like what they see and they become Americans. But it is a, it is a bit of a tragic story. So that's the short, short uh, version of that. The Americans, um, most of the American Northern soldiers, um, uh, Washington will, will get some reinforcements from those guys down to the main army. Uh, but most of those guys will continue to serve up in the Northern department to make sure there's no more threats coming down from Canada. All right, we're going to have to take two more questions, one more in person, and then one more on Zoom. Okay. Thank you. I very much enjoyed your talk. I think you did bring some new information for me. Thank you, sir. Regarding the battle, one of your slides, you have a peculiar boot there. And the boot was um, appeared to be a monument. And yes. It's the only monument that was ever uh, erected or honoring Benedict Arnold because he, he unfortunately was disrespected up there's the boot yes the boot doesn't have his legend i think he said a magnificent charge he did and then the charge of grabbing morgan's and the sharpshooters were actually firing against the british and even though he didn't care about it, whether he lived or died he was a, just an extremely brave warrior but there's the boot that's instructing from all that's the only monument or anything that's kind of a in his honor there's I don't know if you can call it a monument in his honor, but at West Point, in the old cadet chapel, there is uh, on, the, on the walls, there are plaques for every Revolutionary War general. And there's one for Benedict Arnold, except they've, they've ground off his name. So it's a blank plaque. So, so you can say there's two. All right, our final question from Zoom is about Jane McCray. And um, do you give any credence to the, um, the story of Jane McCray and her role in bringing out the uh, militia? Right, so this, the question is Jane McCray and the, the murder of Jane McCray uh, and uh, bringing out the militia. So it, it all comes down to timing. And I think um, the murder of Jane McCray, which was probably friendly fire and, and not, she was definitely scalped, uh, by the British uh, Native American warriors, for sure. We know that for sure. Um, but she was probably accidentally killed by American militia who fired on the Native American party who had, who had basically kidnapped her and were starting to bring her back to uh, their headquarters. So, um, so at any rate, so, so that, that did happen. We know that happened. Um, it probably was not a major factor in bringing out uh, the militia, because it was one of many atrocities that had taken place. In fact, when Schuyler writes about it in one of his reports, he just talks about, you know, a young woman was, uh, was murdered by the uh, enemy savages or something along those lines. And in almost every report, he's writing something like that. So it was just kind of, a, it, that was, they were dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, when Gates takes over, he, start, he, he uh, writes a letter to Burgoyne and specifically brings up that particular incident and saying how, you know, you guys are uh, you know, uh, basically committing war crimes and we're not going to stoop to your level, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but, but by that time, the militia was already coming out, especially after Bennington. And, and I, I really don't think that it's just that the timing didn't work right. It, it had a huge role in American propaganda later on in the, in the fall and then the winter. Uh, and it goes all the way back to Britain. In fact, there's there's uh, debates in Parliament about the you know, Jane McCrae comes up in debates in Parliament about the um, many many folks in Parliament are are protesting the British use of Native Americans uh, in in fighting. Um, so so it, it does come up. It's an important. She plays an important role uh, in in uh, death uh, for American propaganda. Very very useful uh, American propaganda. But I think other other things had more to do with uh, bringing out the militia. All right. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.